Royalty can be awarded based on the patent statute and is commonly used in license negotiations. Running royalties are royalties based on sales of an infringing product. A lump sum or paid up royalty is a payment that is a single payment but frequently based on a running royalty calculation. Before getting into royalty rate specifics, it's a good idea to step back and get a sense of how overall royalty calculations are done. In this video, I'll point out typical items that are in that big picture and then go through a sample calculation. There are two important points to understand at the outset about royalties, apart from the factors that might go into setting any particular royalty rate. First, royalties are based on the manufacture, sales, and or use in a particular country where a patent exists. Second, royalties are based on the portion of the product that actually embodies the invention. Royalties can only be obtained in countries where a patent exists and an infringing act occurs. Royalty rates in any particular country will most likely vary based on what that particular country's laws are. The United States typically has the highest royalty rates, as its patent infringement awards are the highest, as well as the cost of litigating a patent from a potential infringer's perspective. As such, potential infringers are more likely to pay more to avoid a U.S. lawsuit than they would to avoid lawsuits in other countries. Note that most patent statutes worldwide include some version of the make, use, or sell language for infringement. If you own a patent in a country where the product is manufactured, you can then get a royalty on the manufacturing that is done in that country, and by extension, get a royalty on all the sales of the product. However, it's important that where that country of manufacture is has a decent patent enforcement system. If no patent exists in the country of manufacture, then one has to look at the sales in countries where the patents do exist. U.S. patents are valuable because the U.S. is a large market, even if the products are manufactured elsewhere. For a patent owner, this is an important consideration. In many foreign countries, it is expensive to maintain a patent over the course of the patent's life. If it is difficult to enforce the patent in those countries, or the damage awards are low, it's not a good commercial decision to maintain a patent in that country. For example, in many countries in Europe, it is impossible to get what is called discovery in the United States. That is, a patent owner cannot go to court with some level of evidence of infringement and request that a potential infringer provide information. Using an improved method of manufacture, for example, a patent owner has limited ability to find out if its patent is actually being used in many countries in Europe. In that case, while the invention may be good, it makes little sense to pay high maintenance fees for what is essentially an unenforceable patent. The second point is that royalties are based on the infringing portion of the device. This has become a more active area of the law recently, as any particular product involves so many different patents. For example, if a patent relates to an improved GPS antenna on a cell phone, the basis on which the royalty is calculated will be on the value of that antenna, or the value of the GPS system to the whole phone, not on the entire cell phone. Of course, the royalty may be calculated based on the value of the phone. In such case, the royalty rate would be lowered. It's just a little algebra to make that happen. In licensing negotiations, the royalty basis, or cost basis, is a heavily negotiated issue, resulting in sometimes complicated licensing provisions. Frequently, non-patent issues come into play, too. The royalty basis needs to be easy for an accounting department to administer. It is important to distinguish the difference between a court award of a reasonable royalty and a negotiation of the value of a technology. The difference between these negotiations is sometimes referred to as a carrot versus stick licensing. The stick is what a court might award. Both valuations use many of the same considerations. However, it's important to distinguish the two types of valuations. Courts award either lost profits or a reasonable royalty for patent infringement cases. There are rules for calculating both. Businesses take a broader view, where the patents are but one part of an overall deal. Other important factors may have as much or more value than the patents. For example, the know-how, trade secrets, process specifications, brand awareness, and other factors may have a large bearing on a commercial technology transfer deal, more so than simply the patent rights. This presentation looks at the stick licensing approach, what a court might award an infringer in a particular situation. Let's look at an example, which is of course done in a spreadsheet. The form and details of the spreadsheet may vary, but some version of these components will exist. A market size in locations where a patent exists and an infringing act occurs is estimated in units or cash sales. 
Adjustments are made to the net sales price to reflect the portion of the product the patent actually covers. A royalty is estimated, and the royalty due is calculated. Let's have a look at such a spreadsheet. In this example, I use a unit sales figure, in this case 100,000 units. The overall net sales price of each unit is made to be $500. Remember, this is an often negotiated point. To address the idea that the net sales price encompasses items not associated with the patent, I take a percentage of that price. This is the situation where the patent might cover an improved GPS antenna for use in a cell phone. The net sales price of the cell phone is based on any number of features, not just the GPS. In this example, I use 15% of the net sales price being associated with the patent. This can be done in a number of ways. For example, if one knows the actual specific component price, for example, the price of the GPS antenna, that number can be used instead of an estimate. Together, the net sales price and the percent associated with the patent create the cost basis for the royalty. I then pick a royalty rate. Again, a lot goes into that number, but in this case, I use 5% in the U.S. as an example. In practice, be sure that the royalty rate is less than the profit margin. Consider additional royalties that the manufacturer might have to pay. Those cumulative royalties should not be higher than the profit margin. I frequently use a number of rates in any particular spreadsheet. The royalty rate times the cost basis will result in the royalty per unit. This is a good sanity check number. Would a potential infringer really pay this, or how much of a fight would it really be? The royalty rate per unit times the number of units gives an overall royalty due. Making the spreadsheet more complex, one typically estimates the sales per year for the life of the patent or for the life of the proposed agreement. Adding more detail, no particular countries are accounted for in this example. Patent royalties can only be obtained in countries in which there is a patent and an infringing act. In this example, I'll add a second country, France, to account for, say, sales in France. Note that I use a lower royalty rate for France. That is typical as countries outside the U.S. usually command a lower royalty rate, as damage judgments are lower than in the U.S. Finally, I create a grand total as well as a net present value. The net present value is useful when trying to arrive at a lump sum payment for the patent. That is requested by some licensees. It is also used when companies are seeking to purchase a patent that it will later license. This spreadsheet shows unit sales flat in both countries over time. Typically, sales vary by country and hopefully unit sales will go up and the prices will go down and patent owners might lower their royalty rates over time. Here is the same spreadsheet format with the relevant numbers changed to reflect such a scenario. Note that playing with these numbers in the spreadsheet can create very different values for the patent. In this scenario, the net present value goes from roughly 2.67 million down to 1.78 million. It's those differences that are the subject of so many hours of negotiations in these agreements. That's how royalty calculations and patent valuations are generally done. The form and details of the spreadsheet may vary, but the components are all there. A market size in the locations where a patent exists and an infringing act occurs is estimated. And units are cash sales, acknowledging that the net sales price and sales volume will change over time. Adjustments are made to the net sales price to reflect the portion of the product the patent actually covers. A royalty in each country is estimated, acknowledging that that rate may change over time. The overall cash flow during the life of the patent or the agreement is then estimated. Add specific facts, a couple of MBAs, a couple of patent attorneys, a spreadsheet jockey, and it will get complex. But the basic idea is the same. Finally, a quick note on the old 25% rule, which has been specifically excluded as a reasonable way to calculate royalties by courts. The 25% rule has been in use for decades. Like other things made illegal, it will simply go underground. That rule states generally that the royalty rate should be on the order of 25% of the profit margin for a product. Today, that rule does not make a lot of sense for many products because so many patents are infringed by any particular product. For a simple one patent product, the bottle opener example I've used in other videos, that might make sense. For a cell phone, it makes no sense. A patent addressing an improved GPS antenna for use in a cell phone cannot command that high a royalty rate. Perhaps if it is applied only to the component value of the antenna, it makes more sense. But that's a royalty basis issue.
A royalty of 25% of profits is not in and of itself a particularly shocking number. The 25% rule will probably be used as a rule of thumb in backstreet alleys for a long time without anyone really admitting it. I hope this helps and thanks for watching. Thank you.